I came to Nebraska from New York City. I was practicing with the trial firm of Henry Rothblatt in New York before I came here. However, my roots in Nebraska go back to my great-grandfather, John Stevens, who homesteaded here after having been wounded twice at Vicksburg fighting for the Union with the Iowa 9th Infantry. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm an attorney with the Department of Justice where I prosecute bankruptcy fraud. Well, I grew up in Ottawa, Iowa. Front door was in town, back door was in the country. And I went to college at Stanford University, and I went to law school at Northwestern University, and I am a graduate of the Infantry Officer School and the Judge Advocate General School. I uh, attended Rollins College. It's a liberal arts college in Winter Park, Ohio. And I studied Spanish, French, and philosophy. Well, I was the first one who got interested in um, the saga of Carol Fugate. I've always, always loved murder mysteries and books about spree killers and uh, true crime novels. And so I was just drawn into Stark Leather's murder spree. I, I went out and read as many books as I could find about him. And then eventually I ordered the trial transcripts. And it was after I read the trial transcripts that I discovered Carol Fugate was really a victim of a, a terrible travesty. And um, I began the book and I met Steve when I came to Lincoln to interview uh, James MacArthur, who was her appellate attorney. Mm -hmm. And James MacArthur was going to be on Steve's radio show, so one thing led to another. And that's how Steve and I met, and eventually I asked him if he would like to co-author the book with me. Well, I was uh, talking with Jim MacArthur on my radio show, and Carol called in. And we were all astonished. This was at KLIN. We canceled commercials. We ran overtime. We ran through the sports show. She called again the next day. And I became fascinated, not just with what she said, but how many people called in to this unannounced program saying, I always knew you were innocent, and here's why. And the police wouldn't listen to me, and here's why and my parents wouldn't let me testify, and here's why. I was astonished because I, like everybody else in Nebraska, casually assumed she was guilty. Uh, meeting with Linda and uh, hearing her take on it changed my perspective completely, and I became convinced that Carol was a victim not only of stark weather, but of the judicial system. Mm -hmm. And uh, through Linda and my work with Linda, I, I became fascinated with the case. My biggest wish is that Carol will be granted a pardon. And I hope that after people read the book, they will see for themselves that she really was a victim and not a participant in any of the murders. Um, the book also shows that there was a conspiracy between the prosecution and uh, the authorities, really, to railroad her. And I think people have been lied to many, many years about what happened. I think this book sets the truth out, and I always believed the truth shall set you free. I'm hoping that we turn the tide of public opinion against Carol, whereby in 1958 everybody hated her and knew she was guilty. I want people to read the book, change their minds, and get busy and see if they can help us right a terrible injustice by perhaps writing to the pardon board. The Board of Pardons in Nebraska consists of the governor the Attorney General and the Secretary of State. We have sent copies of this book to both candidates for governor, 
we will be sending copies to both candidates for the other two offices. I'd like commitments from them that they will at least give us a hearing. All we ask is a hearing. And uh, I think that, A, she's innocent, but the thing that enrages me is that the people in Nebraska, including the journalists who covered the case, all accepted Starkweather's lies as the truth. And I can start a fight in any bar in Lincoln by saying anything nice about Carol Fugate because people are invested in believing Charles Starkweather's lies. I don't believe this. I'm going to read a few segments from the time that Carol left school and got home and opened the door to find a shotgun in her face. I will also read some parts from our book. There was one part where of necessity, although this is a joint effort, of necessity I slipped into the first person I had to. And I, I will read some parts from that. I'm hoping that Linda will talk a little bit about her relationship with Carol, which is a very touching story. And I'm hoping that Linda will read a, a number of very touching things she's written I am going to try to hit on a few legal issues. We will entertain questions, and I've got two guests in the audience who will assist us in that. James MacArthur, who took over the representation of Carol from his father, John MacArthur, and Brett MacArthur, whose book Pro Bono is being marketed as the companion piece to our book. They will both also assist in answers. We expect a certain amount of hostility because people are emotionally invested in believing Starkweather's lies. Good afternoon. I'm Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room, which is down on the third floor, and the John A. James Reading Series. Um, this is the 209th reading. Catherine Kidwell presented the first Ames reading on Thursday, June 20th, 1985. So I don't know if any of you knew Catherine Kidwell, but she was the first. Um, we are here in the fourth floor auditorium of Bennett Martin Public Library today. Uh, as I said, usually we hold the readings on the third floor in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. Um, the Heritage Room holds a special collection that is dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection, of course, because we can't fit everything into that room, but there are more than 13,000 volumes in the collection, and more than 13,000, more than 13,000 volumes, and more than 3,000 Nebraska authors are represented there. Um, we also do have a lot of other things too, magazines, information files, pictures, manuscripts, artwork, and other memorabilia. It's kind of a little museum as well as a book collection. So um, if you have a chance and you haven't been in there or if you'd like to stop by down uh, later today after the reading, um, there actually will be books available for sale. I guess I'll mention that right now. Um, and the, the publisher is selling books today he thought that these two might not be in the same place at the same time to autograph things. So um, it seemed like a good opportunity. And they also are going to give half of the proceeds to the Heritage Room Endowment Fund. So that's, that's cool. Thank you very much. Um, as I was going to say, the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It's supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. And we would like to thank the NLHA for the endowment that they established another, a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. And thanks to those who continue to contribute to the Heritage Room Endowment Fund. Um, we do invite you to visit the Heritage Room, as I said. Um, our regular public service hours are kind of limited, Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3, and Sundays 2 to 5. So actually, we're open right now down there. We have a volunteer who's down there keeping track of things because um, we do have the Ames readings during the public service hours. So um, the Ames readings are also filmed by Five City TV. And if you are not here, 
but you're watching this on Channel 5, I just would tell you that the Heritage Room is located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library, 136 South 14th Street in downtown Lincoln. And we're also pleased that some of the more recent Ames readings are available on Channel 5 Video On Demand. So you can check the Heritage Room website for more details about Ames Reading, the Ames Reading series. Today, for our reading, we're featuring Linda Battisti and John Stevens Very Sr. They have collaborated on a new book in 2014, published by Atticus Books in Omaha. The two authors will share information about the book and read from it. It's entitled The Twelfth Victim, The Innocence of Carol Fugate in the Starkweather Murder Rampage. Um, Linda did her schooling at Rollins College, Winter Park, Florida and also at the Universidad, Universidad de Madrid, in Madrid, Spain, and Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Cleveland, Ohio. She's a trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice, and she prosecutes bankruptcy fraud cases in the Northern District of Ohio. So Linda's here, and Steve attended Stanford University in Stanford, California, Northwestern University in Illinois, and the Infantry School, uh, Infantry Officer School at Fort Benning, Georgia, as well as the Judge, Judge Advocate General School in Charlottesville, Virginia. He's an attorney here and, found it, and founder of the Barry Law Firm here in Lincoln. We are very happy to have both Steve and Linda here with us today. And if you could please help me welcome them, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Battisti. To my immediate left is Steve Berry. We are the co-authors of The Twelfth Victim, The Innocence of Carol Fugate and the Starkweather Murder Rampage. Before I begin, I have several other um, guests I'd like to introduce you to. And uh, I would like to introduce you to, to uh, James MacArthur. He's in the front row here. Uh, James MacArthur is the son of John MacArthur, who was the original trial attorney and defended Carroll in 1959. Uh, this is James here. His son, Jeff MacArthur, is right next to him. Why don't you stand up, gentlemen? Okay, nobody can see you there. Okay. Uh, Jeff MacArthur is also a published author. He wrote the book Pro Bono. And it describes with uh, a lot of love about his grandfather and how his father throughout the years, through receiving absolutely no remuneration for this, have been Carol Fugate's advocates and champions. And um, what Carol told me personally uh, years ago was that John MacArthur was the candle and Meryl Reller was the flame. So that's how she felt about her original attorneys. I would also like to introduce you to two other guests in uh, the audience. My publisher, uh, Rod Colvin, is back there, publisher of Atticus Books, and associate publisher uh, is Jack Cussler. So um, I wanted to thank both gentlemen for making this dream of mine a reality. But today I'm going to read to you um, what happened on Tuesday morning, January 21st, 1958. That was the day Charles Starkweather <coughs> murdered Marion Bartlett, his wife Velda Bartlett, and an almost three-year-old little girl named Betty Jean Bartlett. I'm going to take you back to 1958 and go step by step at what happened during that day. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Okay, if you can't hear me, let me know. All right. <clears throat> Tuesday morning for Velda Bartlett began the same as every other morning. She woke up at 6 a.m., lit a cigarette, made coffee and toast, sat down at the kitchen table, and opened the Lincoln Journal, the city's morning edition. The headlines that morning read, President denies U.S. weak. President Eisenhower had advised 5,000 diners at a $100 a plate GOP rally not to pay any attention to those pessimists who said NATO bases 
could be wiped out by Soviet missiles. The nation's defenses were strong. Velda also read that the famous soprano, Roberta Peters, was in town and would perform tonight with the Lincoln Symphony. Scanning the ads, she saw that Lincoln local dairies would reduce the price of milk, home delivered milk, by one cent. Every penny saved helps, she thought. Carol and Betty Jean joined her at the table. Carol could put Betty Jean in her high chair and sat a glass of milk in front of her. Carol poured her mom another cup of coffee, got a cup for herself, and popped some bread into the toaster. Velda continued reading about how Johnny's Dairy Suite over on 64th and Havelock was running a special introductory offer of one half chicken dinner for 85 cents on Tuesdays and Wednesdays only. Johnny was touting a brand new device to cook chicken with, a pride and joy, a brand new broaster that in just six minutes would give you the best eaten chicken you ever ate. Honey, do you know where I can get a broaster to cook chicken with? Velda asked Carol jokingly. Try Queen for a day, Carol kiddingly retorted as she left the table to get ready for school. The popular afternoon television program featured women who were down on their luck, and one of them would be chosen as queen for that day. She could win such things as cash prizes and a new washer and dryer, maybe even a new gas stove. Evenings at the Bartlett home always included several hours of television. Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock, it was always a toss-up between the Phil Silver Show and Burns and Allen. At 7.30, it was always Eve Arden. At 8 o'clock, to tell the truth, and at 8.30, Bob Cummings. At 9 o'clock, they watched Don Amici. Velda loved comedies. Marion had joined the family for breakfast. Velda got up to answer a knock at the front door. It was Carol's friend and neighbor, Bonnie Gardner, who met Carol every morning to walk the few blocks to the bus that took them to Whittier Junior High School. Today, Bonnie brought a sweater to loan Carol that would match her new black and white dress. Carol put the sweater on, kissed her mom, little sister, and dad goodbye. As the two girls walked out the door, Carol heard her mother tell her dad, Honey, milk goes down one cent tomorrow. Little did Carol realize that those words would be the last she would ever hear her mother speak. Thursday afternoon, January 21st, 1958. The school bell rang at 3.15. Carol met up with Bonnie and both girls took the bus back home. As they stopped outside Carol's house, she took off the sweater she borrowed from Bonnie that morning and walked up to the house. Carol's dog was waiting by the front door. She opened the screen door, let the dog inside, and the front door flew shut behind her. Carol turned around to find Charlie pointing a 22 rifle at her face. Sit down, he ordered. Carol, her heart in her mouth, stared at Charlie dumbfounded. She couldn't move. Sit down, I said. Charlie bellowed as he pushed her down into the rocking chair. Carol stood up. Charlie put down that gun and stop acting so silly. Starkweather shoved her back down again. Angry now, Carol got up again, but this time Starkweather slapped her across the face so hard she fell back down. She started to cry. He continued to aim his rifle at her while he began screaming something about her parents and Betty Jean. They ain't here. Did she know that old lady who let him use her gar garage to work on his hot rod? Well, her folks were there. They're over there because they know too much. 
He asked them if they would go peacefully, and they said they would go peacefully. And he took them out to the old lady's house because they can't be here. They've been taken hostage at the old lady's house. Charlie and his gang are robbing a bank and need a place to hide out. So her folks couldn't be here, he explained. Furthermore, his gang was watching this house. And if Carol tried to escape, he'd know about it because his gang would tell him. And it would be her fault. Everything would be her fault. Carol stared at Charlie and thought the aliens had finally taken over. Here he was, scaring her half to death, smacking her around and rattling on about another one of his stupid ass crazy fairy tales about playing cops and robbers and cowboys and Indians and God knows what his twisted brain could come up with. She had had all she was going to take from this crackpot. I don't believe a word you're saying, Charlie. You're crazy. If you don't shut up and do everything I tell you, they're dead, you hear? I'll make one phone call and they'll be dead and it will be your fault. And don't ever, ever call me crazy again, or I will kill them. Carol thought Charlie had really gone over the edge this time, <clears throat> as if he thought she was so stupid to believe an incredible yarn like this. Bank robbers? Hostages? The whole story was ridiculous, and a figment of his pea-brained imagination she stared at a Charlie Starkweather she had never seen before and wondered if he now believed in his own fantasies. She looked around. Her family wasn't home. When her dad's, with her dad's car still parked in the driveway, she wondered where they were. She had never once returned home from school without her mother being there. It was also dark in the house she noticed that the drapes were drawn. Her anger turned to fear as she realized she was quite alone in the house with the man with a rifle sitting across his lap. He was rubbing the rifle with a rag when he stared into space, into something only he could see. It was as though Carol wasn't in the room. She started to cry and ask Charlie where her folks were, but he didn't answer. He just stared at the wall behind her, his mind a million miles away. She needed to do something to pull Charlie out of his trance and hopefully send him home. Can I get up, she asked. No, he shouted. Can I just go make some coffee? She thought maybe a dose of caffeine will snap this Looney Tune out of his trance. Starkweather followed Carol into the kitchen and sat in Betty Jean's high chair. He still kept rubbing the rifle with a rag, almost as if he were caressing it. It was then that Carol noticed her mother's pistol inserted inside his belt behind his buckle. He looked over at the kitchen window that faced the alley and told Carol his gang was watching her. From the kitchen window, someone could see right into the living room. When the coffee had percolated, Starkweather refused a cup, but Carol poured herself a large one, hoping the caffeine would wake her up out of a bad dream. Go and change your clothes, Starkweather ordered. Go put on a shirt and jeans. No, Charlie, I don't want to, Carol replied. Either you change your goddamn clothes or I'll change them for you, he shouted. He followed Carol as she walked to her room, placed a chair by her open door, and sat down and watched her change her clothes as he continued to rub his rifle. After she changed her clothes, Carol walked into the living room and sat on the sofa. She asked him when she could see her mother. She was worried about her and Betty Jean. If you do everything I tell you to, you can see them later. If you don't, they'll get hurt, and it will be your fault. My fault? Charlie, please, this whole thing is so fantastic. I just can't believe, 
Suddenly, Starkweather threw his gun at Carol. You don't believe me? Then shoot me. Go ahead, just shoot me, he hollered. Cut it out, Charlie, I'm not shooting you. Why are you acting this way? Why are you acting so crazy? Quit acting so crazy, she cried. Shut the hell up, and didn't I tell you don't ever call me crazy, he screamed. She sat there on the Davenport all night, not saying a word. Just sat there listening with incredulity to Starkweather's rambling on and on about how if the cops caught him, tell them O'Brien killed that guy at the crest station. He had nothing to do with it. He threw her mother's black-handled kitchen knife at the wall while she just kept watching him. Starkweather turned on the television. When Carol tried to watch Burns and Allen, he kept throwing the knife at the living room wall. This went on for hours until Carol finally lay down on the Davenport and fell asleep. Starkweather crawled next to her and she cried, get off, but he wouldn't budge. Wednesday, January 22nd, 1958. Carol awakened to the sound of her dog barking incessantly he always did so whenever anybody was outside the house. Starkweather looked out the window and saw Bonnie Gardner, Carol's classmate, waiting on the sidewalk. She was afraid of the dog and wouldn't come right up to the door. Get rid of her, he told Carol. Don't tell her anything or I'll kill her. Carol went to the door, opened it, and told Bonnie that she was sick and wouldn't be going to school that day. Carol turned on the television, and Jimmy Dean was playing. At 8 o'clock a.m., Captain Kangaroo came on, little Betty Jean's favorite show in the whole world. She wondered whether her baby sister was watching Captain Kangaroo at the old lady's house. Starting to cry, Carol wondered whether her folks were all right and what they could be doing. She knew something was terribly wrong. And she also knew that she would do anything to get them all back home safe and sound again. The whole hostage so story still seemed fantastic to Carol, but she had no choice but to believe it. Starkweather kept telling her that his gang was outside the house watching her. If she made one false move, the gang would know and her family would be killed. They would watch her from the kitchen window and know whether she went to the front door. They would know if she tried to escape. He told her, if she didn't do everything he told her, that he would make one phone call and have his gang kill her family. So Carol did whatever Starkweather told her to do. If he wanted eggs, Carol cooked him eggs. When he ordered her to go outside and get the mail, she did it. When he made her follow him to the bathroom and sit on the bed so he could see her when he needed to take a pee, she did it. When he told her to shut up and quit asking him about her family, she shut up. If he had told her to swing like a monkey from the trees, she would have found a way to do that too. In the afternoon, Starkweather's brother, Rodney, came to the door. Starkweather looked out the window and told Carol to get rid of him and not to let him in the house or he would kill him. Carol said he'd never kill his own brother, but Starkweather said he would if he had to. Rodney asked if Charlie was there because he had Rodney's rifle and he wanted it back. Carol said no, she didn't know where Charlie was that she never knew where he was. Rodney thought Carol looked sick. Later on that afternoon, Starkweather told Carol he had to go out and that he was going to tie her up. He cut up a pair of her mother's dish towels into strips and tied her hands together, tied her feet together, and then tied her hands to her feet. He placed her on her side on the Davenport 
and turned on the television and left the house. She lay that way for hours. Carol knew it was about three in the afternoon because Queen for a Day was on. Carol tried to get loose. The dish towels were tied tight and she got all sweaty and out of breath just from trying to get her hands free of the dish towels. When Starkweather came home and saw that she had tried to get loose, he shook her up good and said, if she tried anything like that again, he would make one phone call and her family would be history. Sky King was about to go off the air. Starkweather changed the channel to watch Wagon Train. He loved Westerns. He untied Carol. She sat crying on the Davenport with him until the television test pattern came out. I'm going to skip around. There's been a lot of talk and innuendo that Carol and Charlie were lovers. He told the police, I had sex with her every day in that house, twice on Sundays. I want you to know what really happened. Carol was kicking herself for those nasty things she had told the police about her brother-in-law, Bob. Part of her hoped the cops would repeat to Bob the lies she told about him, and then he would know something was wrong at her home, because she had never said nasty things about Bob before. On the other hand, what if the cops tell him what I said, and he tips them off that something is wrong at home, and the cops come back after Charlie, and they encounter his gang, and then Starkweather makes that phone call like he's been threatening to do, and her family gets killed. Me and my big fat mouth. She was totally alone for the first time in her life and wondered if she was doing the right thing. She kept telling herself that if she saved her family's lives, then by all means, she was doing things right. No matter what she had to do to save them, she would do it. That evening, Starkweather told Carol to go to her room, change into a nightgown, and get into bed. He also told her that he had just talked to her folks at the old lady's house, and they told him to be sure to tell Carol that she was to do anything he told her to do, anything. Carol, mortified, stood with her back to Starkweather while she undressed. He was hollowing at her to hurry up, but her hands shook so much she could barely unbutton her shirt. Once undressed and into one of her shorty nightgowns, she quickly jumped into her bed, pulled the covers over her head, and told Starkweather to get out. But he kept standing over Carol's bed looking at her. Then he started to undress. What the hell are you doing? Get out of here, she cried. He pulled the covers down and lay next to her. He informed her again that her parents said for her to do anything he told her to do. He didn't seem to notice her sanitary napkin hanging between her legs as he climbed on top of her and started touching her and kissing her and telling her how it was going to be one day with them. He said she was the only thing in the world he loved and he didn't need anybody else in the world but her. It's just you and me in our own little world, my own girl to go all the way to the end with me. She turned her head to the side and prayed she might pass out but she didn't pass out. She just lay there helpless and awake while Starkweather groaned softly and tried to enter her. No, she just couldn't do this, not this, she thought. During the entire time she had dated Charlie, they never did anything more than French kiss. Now she found herself naked in bed with him and he was suddenly furious with her. He stopped whatever he was trying, then roughly rolled her over onto her stomach, 
while he rubbed his penis between her two cheeks over and over and over again. At just 14, oh, all the time cussing and swearing and calling her filthy names. At just 14, Carol was not aware of just how the sex act was performed. In her innocence, she did not realize Starkweather was unable to get an erection. Too frustrated to even speak, Starkweather rolled out of bed and cursed her out while he put his clothes back on. He turned on the television. Carol could hear the theme song from the TV Western Gunsmoke, and she felt a wave of nausea cover over her. She was glad she had an empty stomach so she couldn't vomit. And that was one or two days that Carol spent in the house with Starkweather. I don't know if any of you were around back in 1958, but Carol's reputation was about as low as it could get because Starkweather had boasted to the police, the authorities, and golly, anybody who'd want to listen, what a great sex life they had for a whole week in that house. <clears throat> they lived it up. They had a great time. Well, the scene I just described to you, especially we women here, no, that did not sound like the kind of lovemaking that goes on between, two love, uh, between a loving couple. <laughs> there was also something I wanted to bring to your attention. After the uh, arrests and before Carol's trial, there were three prosecutors who would go and visit Starkweather on death row. And um, he had a roommate, Starkweather, on, on death row, Otto Glazer. Now, death row was not exactly death row. It was actually the hospital part of the prison back then. So Otto Glazer was recuperating, and it just so happened, you know, he was, his next door neighbor was Charles Starkweather. And he and Starkweather would talk a lot, and um, Glazer noticed that, you know, maybe a week prior to Carol's trial, he heard three voices by Starkweather's door. And he could recognize the voices, and he could also recognize the faces, but never once could he put a name to one of the faces. But that is once when Otto Glazer overheard these three gentlemen coax Starkweather on what he was to tell the jury at Carroll's trial. They were very, very careful to tell him, you must say what we tell you to do and must not say what we tell you not to do. When you are on the witness stand and John MacArthur starts questioning you, you must be very, very careful. And if he asks you questions we don't want you to answer, tell him I don't know or I don't want to tell you. Part of what Otto Glazer overheard was that, first of all, he overheard Starkweather tell these three individuals, I should have killed that bitch when I had the chance. I should have killed her. I had the opportunity. I used violence on her. She tried to escape from me. They go, no, 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 no. You must never say that on the witness stand. Never say that on the witness stand. What was he telling them? Hey, Carol was my hostage all the time. No, no, no. We must not say that. And if you want proof that he was coached and proof that Starkweather refused to answer John MacArthur's problems, it's here in the book. It's here in the book. Another thing Starkweather was to make sure he told the jury, and I can't for the life of me figure out why, he was to tell the jury that he killed Marion Bartlett first. That never happened. Marion Bartlett was killed last. He had to have been because he was killed between 1.20 and 2 o'clock. At 1.20 that day, Marion Bartlett was seen at the supermarket by a woman he worked with at his job. She sees him at 1.20. She goes back to work at 2 o'clock, and the person who took over um, the service board for her said, hey, I just got this message from a man and um, he said, Marion Bartlett's sick. He's not coming into work. That was before 2 o'clock. 
Marion Bartlett was killed between 1.20 and 2 o'clock. I believe when he opened the door that he saw his wife and child slaughtered before him. And for some whatever reason, people wanted everyone to think that Marion was killed first. Why? I don't know. I don't believe that. It's impossible. It's totally impossible. But anyway, with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn it over to my co-author, Steve Berry. Well, uh, first of all, can everyone hear me if I talk into the mic like this? Not sure I need a mic, but uh, I'll do my best. Thank you, Linda, and I want to thank you for the well over 10 years you spent talking to, well, it was 15 years you spent talking with Carol. Margaret and I have met Carol, been very impressed with her, enjoyed her, but we have Linda here, a trained lawyer, a federal prosecutor, somebody who knows the law and knows witnesses and can spot a liar, who's talked to Carol for 15 years, not heard rumors about her for 15 years, not had 15 years to think about what Starkweather said about her, but actually talk with her. Well, who did she introduce? Jim MacArthur. Jim MacArthur met Carol Fugate in 1958. Jim MacArthur, a fellow lawyer, we're good friends, and he told me, I am convinced that she never lied to me about anything. If she was ever inconsistent, if she was ever exaggerating about anything, I've spent my life in the courtroom. I spent my high school years watching my dad, John MacArthur, try cases. My life has been the law, and Carol Fugate was telling me the truth, and I've been talking to her since 1958. Now, why do I mention that? I mention it because I can start a ruckus in any bar in Lincoln by going in and saying one kind word about Carol Fugate. I do not understand the obsession people have with believing Charles Starkweather. And I will talk about that in my book a little bit. People believe Charles Starkweather and they get a little angry if you say that anything Charles Starkweather said wasn't true. How could a person who would kill 11 people and change his story, how many times was it, nine or 11? Nine, nine different times. How could he possibly be lying? So, and, and, and there'll be at least one or two people in this audience who will say, by God, John Starkweather was telling the truth. Well, they got their they only emotional, uh, and we'll talk about this later after the formal presentation. Now, Linda welcomed some people. I want to tell you that I, I, I'm kind of flattered that there's a couple other distinguished authors right in the front row. Uh, we've got Lita Powell Drake, and you don't need to stand up, Lita, but she just wrote a real good book, and she is... Uh, uh, she's an expert at horseshoes, I might tell you. Do not wager her in a game of horseshoes. It's a trap. And her book will charm you. And then over on this side, we've got Gary Gablehaus. And if Lita's book will charm you, Gary's book will scare the hell out of you, all of his books. So we're kind of surrounded by a lot of good friends here, a lot of excellent authors and uh, other people. I just wanted to to say that, I'm going to read a little bit now, but I, but, but I have to tell you, when I mention this part in what I read, I have been around quite a bit, seen a few cases, tried a few cases, served in combat a little bit, seen a few things here and there, and I've never seen anything like the fanaticism with which some people will cling to Starkweather's words on the stand. And uh, I, I will, uh, as I said, I, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do because Linda and I didn't have a chance to rehearse. So I'll kind of go through my books. I have a few things, our book, and there is a part in which all of us decided I should switch into the first person. Uh, to tell a story, so I do it. I apologize for that. Uh, I want to start with uh, my introduction. Uh, 
Jeff MacArthur was kind enough to point out that Linda and I kind of give a one-two punch because she, with her 15 years of close association with Carol, really knows her heart. And I, uh, I come, she comes from a point of compassion. Uh, it's possible that I maybe have come from a point of a little anger. I have been in situations in which I had to use my 45 pistol to get into a village to conduct a hearing. And uh, it's not quite that bad in Lincoln. But as I said, if I, want, if, I want, if I wanted to start a ruckus in any bar in Lincoln, I could just say one nice thing about Carol Fugate, and there'd be somebody who would tell me, nope, Starkweather is the Messiah. And whatever he's, which I will choose one of his nine versions, and that will be the truth. So let me begin reading now, having, uh, having given you the sermon. Remember the famous pastor who said, I tell him what I'm going to tell him, and then I tell him, and then I tell him what I just told him? That's, that's a little what I'm going to do, but uh, Linda will bring us back to sanity before we conclude our, our proceedings here today. This is from my introduction. We each wrote a separate introduction because she was in Cleveland, and I was in Lincoln, and our publisher and editors were in Omaha, and we trying to do that. Charles Starkweather is buried in the Wyuka Cemetery in Lincoln, Nebraska. It is a peaceful historical cemetery, which is also the burial place of many distinguished citizens, including Gordon McRae, star of the musical Oklahoma. On Gordon McRae's tombstone, there are the opening bars of Oh, what a beautiful morning. On Starkweather's tombstone, it simply says, rest in peace. Many people have commented the wording should be, fry in hell. Starkweather's testimony convicting Carol and his statement that she should be on his lap when he went to the electric chair are still quoted throughout Nebraska. People who cannot remember a single phrase of Nebraska's great commoner, William Jennings Bryan, or other distinguished Nebraskans, President Gerald Ford, actor Marlon Brando, talk show host Carson and Dick Cavett, and many, many others who are still living can tell you that Starkweather said she should sit on his lap when he went to the chair. I mention this to show that Carol Fugate could not have received a fair trial in Lincoln, Nebraska more than 50 years ago. It is inconceivable in today's criminal justice system that Carol Fugate would have been tried and prosecuted as an adult. In fact, she wouldn't have been prosecuted at all. Besides her age, limited education, and mental state, there was just too much evidence in her favor. After witnessing the murder of August Meyer, Carol, like any other 14-year-old girl, and in fact most adults, would have been in such a state of shock and disbelief as to be rendered numb. Most of the people who condemn Carol have never been under this kind of stress she was under as a hostage. Some combat-trained adults, after seeing just a fraction of the brutality Carol saw, have undergone personality disintegration. Some have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, a condition that had not been heard of at the time Carol was tried. Many adults have become confused and disoriented while going through the process of a murder trial. Yet Carol, who had failed a grade in school, who had come from a disadvantaged background, who was not yet 15 at the time of the gruesome acts of Charles Starkweather, was criticized for her courtroom performance and her statements to police as though she had awkwardly stumbled during a ballet recital. People actually enjoyed immortalizing Starkweather's lies about her guilt. The purpose of this book is not only to show how brutally and unfairly Carol was treated 
by the judicial system in ways that would not be tolerated under today's laws, but also to demonstrate her innocence and her actually having been another victim of stark weather. I am going a little later to talk briefly and not with great complexity about the change in laws, but I want you all to know that there will be an application for a full pardon for Carol that will be filed, and it is in the process of being drawn up, and that copies of the books have been sent to both candidates for governor, and copies of the book will be sent to both candidates for secretary of state and attorney general. And I would like a commitment from all those people that they will at least give her a hearing. I don't ask a commitment that they pardon her, but I ask that she at least be given a hearing. And uh, the courageous among those candidates might say, hell no, Barry, I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to keep after them until they tell me whether or not they're at least promised. They don't have to promise me a pardon. I just want a hearing. I think that uh, the truth will come out. Back when the murders occurred, I, like many people in Nebraska, casually accepted the fact that Carol Fugate was guilty of murder by her association with Starkweather during his mad killing spree. Carol was seen by the general public as a combination of Ma Barker, Bonnie Bar Parker of Bonnie and Clyde, and Lolita, girl woman caught up in the thrill and excitement of a murderous rampage of her boyfriend Starkweather. I was as ignorant as the rest of the state of Nebraska as to the courage Carol exhibited while she was hostage. And um, I'm going to skip a little here because I have some other things I want to carry. But I, I go on to say, I had not realized at that time that Carol was a true victim. She was not only a victim of being a juvenile charged and tried as an adult, but also the victim of being convicted under archaic laws that were in play prior to the passage of the Miranda decision that requires police to advise an arrested person they have a right to remain silent and the right to legal counsel. In 1958, she didn't have any such rights. I'll explain the history of that later a little bit. I became acquainted with Carol Fugate when she was a call-in on my radio program. It used to be called the old John Stevens Berry Show. And during this part, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, I learned more about her story. Shortly after Carol had been refused her pardon by the state, she began telling the story of her life on my program. I was astonished by the number of telephone calls that came in from listeners who were convinced that she could not possibly have known that her family was dead and that she could not possibly have participated in their killings. I was most astonished that, as Carol explained, she never had a chance to tell her story. Now, some of you may say, wait a minute, she had a lawyer and she had a trial. But trials don't work that way, and the legal system doesn't work that way. Uh, in the old Western movies, I kind of liked when they say, okay, Joe, now you tell them your story. That isn't quite the way it happens in the courtroom. Uh, we like to think that under the crucible of cross-examination, the truth will out, but uh, I actually represented one of the Beatrice Six who was unjustly in jail in the prison for 20 years. So we know that justice doesn't always win. Thinking that her story must be told and remembering again and again of the great author Dostoevsky's admonition that a universe without justice is unthinkable, I felt compelled to help write this book so the truth would finally emerge from the blizzard of lies, misconceptions, and inaccuracies that surrounded this travesty of a prosecution, trial, and conviction of an innocent Nebraska girl. Now, we have been running pretty long, and I, but I still have some things I have to read. I'll try not to run over. We start our summary with this quote. This is from the United States Supreme Court, Giles versus Maryland. 
A criminal trial is not a game in which the state's function is to outwit and entrap its query. The state's pursuit is justice, not a victim. Unfortunately, this case was not written until 1967, a little late for Carol Fugate, just as Miranda, Gideon, Escobedo, and all of the cases that are the center of our legal system today had not been decided yet. Now, I mention this in detail in the book, but I can say it more quickly to you than I won't read those parts. Here's what happened. Constitution, the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, well, they applied to federal courts, where Linda practices, but not in state courts where John MacArthur did most of his work. They didn't apply until very recent history, the end of the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was passed, and it said everybody gets due process. So all of a sudden, you would think the 10 Amendments, uh, the, 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 the Bill of Rights would apply to the states. But nobody put two and two together. Well, Dwight Eisenhower needed the help of Earl Warren to get the Republican nomination. So he got it, and Warren got to be Chief Justice. And Warren decided, with the Warren court, that he was going to drag through the 14th Amendment the Bill of Rights into state courts. People were horrified. Now, let me tell you, Miranda was controversial. Here's what it is. The Fifth Amendment says you can't be forced to testify against yourself. The Sixth Amendment says you're entitled to counsel. Well, what if you're supposed to read the Fifth and Sixth Amendments together? What if it means you have the right to remain silent and you're entitled to a lawyer? Well, damn all. They figured that out in the mid-60s. What year was that, Jim MacArthur? You're exactly right. It was 1960, 1966, and the 14th Amendment was passed after the Civil War. Now, people were saying, oh boy, this Warren uh, Court, they're really, uh, they're legislating, they're changing the law. Hell no, they didn't change the law. That was always in the Constitution. They just started to read the damn thing. And this was too late for Carol Fugate. All right, now I'll calm down, Lou. <laughs> And, and I'll, I'll start reading. I, I, I have asked Linda to, to signal me if I start getting a little rambunctious. When I ponder the story of Carol Fugate, and I think about the decades worth of comments I have heard about what she should have done, it brings to mind an incident I learned of in Vietnam. At that time, a young but experienced infantry lieutenant was on a combat crawl, cradling his weapon, intent on his mission. Suddenly, one of Vietnam's many venomous snakes appeared next to him, ready to strike. Instinctively, the lieutenant reared up and was immediately sawed in half by the enemy's automatic rifle fire. Armchair combatants people who have never faced the real pressure of combat or other extreme might well ask, well, why didn't he just? Some people who have never been in real danger or under extreme pressure ask the same question about Carol Fugate. Why didn't she must? We all have fears. Most fears pale compared to the actual terror felt by the people in Lincoln, Nebraska and surrounding communities in 1958 when Charles Starkweather went on his 11-person murder spree. The Nebraska National Guard was called out. Parents hustled their children into their homes. Men with shotguns voluntarily patrolled the streets. Farmers sat on their front porches with their hunting rifles at the ready. The fear felt in Lincoln at the time affected any juror or panel of jurors who would have ju judged Carol Fugate. But there was another kind of fear felt that year. The fear 14-year-old Carol Fugate experienced 
when Charles Starkweather took her captive and told her that her parents and baby sis sister were being held by his gang and would be killed if she didn't go with him and do exactly as she was told. All he had to do, he told her, was to make one phone call to his gang and the job would be done. Carol managed to survive that fear, though she was in a state of absolute panic and nervous collapse by the time she escaped Starkweather and ran toward a law enforcement officer begging for help. Oh, I think I'll skip a couple of pages about the progress we've made in adolescent psychology, about post-traumatic stress disorder, of what we've learned since. Uh, it's in the book. I'll just give you a little taste of it. A clinical psychologist and practitioner of the Erickson method of hypnosis examined Carol in 1990 and concluded his report by saying this, I saw film clips of Carol Fugate during the trial when she was 15. In my clinical opinion, Carol Fugate had and still does have a problem of connecting her thinking to her affect. She was experienced as hard, calloused, and cold in those 1959 film clips. When hypnosis helped her with an affect bridge, that is when her feelings and thoughts connected. People thought she was innocent. I have reason to believe that if proper psychiatric help were available in 1959 that had done the same connecting of affect, she would have been found not guilty. Well, he didn't know that jury, but uh, uh, he, 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 was, he, was, he was assuming that they were a jury who was willing to do their job. Now, as it happens, the jury, under the statute, which is unconstitutional, by the way, but uh, it was discretionary, uh, no guidelines, and uh, so they could just make whatever penalty they want. So they went back, and they, uh, the statute says find, a, find guilt or innocence and decide sentence. Well, they've admitted, and it's right here in the book, that what they did, they went back and said, well, let's give her life. And so they said, okay, let's find her guilty on count one. So they said, came back, having sentenced her first, then made a finding of guilt, didn't bother with count two. I mean, it was, it, uh, one of the jurors had made a wager on the outcome of the case. A record was made about that. The trial judge didn't care. The Nebraska Supreme Court didn't care. Uh, somebody eventually did care, uh, a, fellow, a federal appellate judge. And I'm going to read a little bit of of. His, his opinion, but once again, people who have never, people who if they ever were under a rocket attack, well, they and their laundry man would know how they felt, but nobody else would. Those people say, oh, I would have escaped. Uh, I would have been tough and strong. I would have been like Randolph Scott in the movies. Believe me, I've seen pretty I've seen pretty well-trained people crumble under pressure. After Carol's escape from Starkweather, when she ran to the, and what a mistake, running to a law enforcement car. She would have been so much better off if she had run to the car of any citizen. Think about that, you run to the, you're Carol Fugate, and you run to a law enforcement vehicle, and, and you believe they're going to be your friends? Because in second grade you were taught a song, the policeman is our friend? Didn't work that way. After Carol's escape from Starkweather, Sheriff Heflin's law, Hazel, who first cared for Carol immediately after her arrest, was quoted as saying, I don't think she knows her family is dead. When various op officials mentioned to Carol that her family had been murdered, she refused to believe it. She had been given sedatives. They're gonna question this hysterical girl. Do they get her a lawyer? Do they have her get, get her a physical exam? No, they give her some sedatives. Dope her up a little, grill her for 17 hours. That's the way you do it. 
at the time Carol was first incarcerated, and she hadn't appeared at a county court, she, did, she didn't know that by waiving extradition, she was voluntarily going from a non-death penalty state to a death penalty state. She didn't know there were lawyers out there who would represent people for free. And yes, I personally have tried a three-week capital case, a three-week first-degree murder case without one penny of remuneration because I wanted the guy to get his rights. I got paid in Vietnam, $65 a month combat pay, so don't think I was doing that free. <laughs> lawyers will work for free. In fact, the old barristers wore cloaks with hoods. When they were done with their work, they'd turn their back, and a client could, if he wanted to, put a coin in that hood. There would have been no problem with her getting a lawyer, believe me. She just wasn't told she could get a lawyer. They just said, well, one won't be appointed until after you're arraigned in district court. It is interesting, uh, let's see. Carol was not represented by counsel from the time of her arrest until after her statements had been taken, a period of six days. She requested counsel as early as January 29, 1958, when she waived extradition in Wyoming and renewed the request for counsel on at least two subsequent occasions. Furthermore, it appears that she was misled to believing that she could have counsel only if she or her parents could retain counsel. The warning, there is a warning, and they cobble together this statement and it doesn't come up to a confession. It just doesn't. But the warning appears on page 126 of the 165 pages of the recorded interrogation. You know, I think, forgive my saying this, because I know you're, you're all very strong-minded and good character citizens, but I'll bet if I had any one of you in a cell and worked on you for 17 hours, I'll bet I could make you admit you were the Boston Strangler. <laughs> I'll bet I could make you admit that you had kidnapped the Lindbergh baby. Or, I could make you wish you had, one of the two. <laughs> uh, Linda talked a little bit about Oliver Glaser seeing how Starkweather was told that he, he would get out of the, uh, escape the electric chair if he said the right things, and how he got all, kind, all the cigarettes he wanted, all the candy bars he wanted, and got to sit by the TV, and his hearing right before he testified, his argument before the Supreme Court was coming up, and I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna tell you that this Otto Glazer's affidavit was one of the interesting things. Another interesting thing I mentioned here, I'm not gonna read it aloud because I'm running out of time. F. Lee Bailey, who's part of O.J. Simpson's dream team, famous lawyer. I've tried cases with him when I was practicing in New York, and he believed in the polygraph. He said the polygraph is always right. And he said someday the polygraphs will replace trials. Well, he had a case, uh, a show called Lie Detector. He would rubbed his hands together to get Carol on that show. He was gonna show she was a liar. Well, she passed the test. So he had her do it again. And she passed again. So he had her do it again. But even F. Lee Bailey could not break her because Guess what? She was telling the truth. She was a hostage. She passed those polygraph tests. I, because I'm running out of time, I, I have to have one more quote, though. I got to get this in, or am I out of time? Let me, let, let me give you one paragraph, and, and, then, and then she'll bring us to a conclusion. Federal appeal appellate judge before whom Jim MacArthur argued said, I am totally unconvinced with the facade of fairness that the county attorney erected to shield the interrogation process. 
I have too much confidence in the Nebraska bar not to feel confident that a simple request to that bar from the county attorney's office to provide free counsel for Carol until she was bound over would have met with immediate acceptance. I've just scratched the surface. It's all here in the book and I'm out of time. Linda, would you bring us to a conclusion? So, do you see a comparison between me and Steve with Meryl Roller and John MacArthur? <laughs> who's the candle and who's the flame? <laughs> I want to thank everybody for, for coming here. I appreciate it. It's a great honor to be here uh, at the Heritage Room. And um, I hope you all have a very lovely evening. Thank you.